Hermes Academy. Power, patience, continence, and faith. We teach virtue. Hey y'all, Coach Jennifer here, talking about the correct timing of the Feast of Weeks or First Fruits, as we call it. And in today's video, I'm going to show you three scriptural proofs that the traditional reckoning for the Feast of First Fruits is off by a week. Now, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, let's come over to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, which is a chapter all about the statutes or the holy appointments of our father. That's where we hear about Passover and Atonement Day and the memorial blowing of trumpets, along with the mandatory festivals, including the Sabbath day, all in one chapter. Now, we're going to jump all the way down to verse 9, where it starts talking about the Feast of first fruits. Now, one element of the timing is where it says, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you. I don't plan on covering that particular part in this video. What I do want to cover is down in verse 15, where it starts telling us when the Feast of first fruits is. It says, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Now, I do need to point out how the wording of this is slightly different over in the Septuagint translation of the Bible. There, when you read verse 15, it says, From the day on which you shall offer the sheaf of the heave offering, seven full weeks. So, whereas the King James Version says, Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. The Septuagint says, Seven full weeks. Now, that does make a difference when we're trying to reckon exactly when this day is. Especially when you look at verse 16, where it says, Unto the morrow after the last week shall ye number fifty days in the Septuagint. And the King James Version says, The morrow after the seventh Sabbath. Now, you can see why the translators could have assumed that these verses are saying the same thing, while one is saying after the seventh Sabbath, and the other one is saying, seven full weeks well that's actually a difference of one day the week is full on the sabbath day so the septuagint is pointing to a sabbath day while the king james version is pointing to the day after the sabbath day that's a one day difference but anyway we'll come back to that because those seven full weeks is talking about the end of the pentecost and there's really no need to try to understand the end of the Pentecost until we understand the beginning of those 50 weeks. So let me show you the first scriptural evidence that the current reckoning of the Feast of First Fruits is actually off by a week. Now we're looking at a website called tedmontgomery.com which is one of many websites that will give you the dates of the feast days. So let's look in the year 2022 when it's saying that the Feast of First Fruits falls on April the 17th. And we know that they're using Passover and unleavened bread interchangeably. So it is talking about that week long festival, which means that according to their reckoning, the Feast of First Fruits and the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread are on the same day two festivals on the same day and this is the way they reckon it every year you see in 2024 they're saying that the week-long festival of Passover or unleavened bread starts on April the 23rd but the feast of first fruits starts on April the 28th so it would land in the middle of the week and again you have two feast days on the same day 
How can you call them separate festivals when they actually land on the same day? Well, hold on, because that brings me to my scriptural proof and how that is that they are in conflict with one another if they fall on the same day. You're looking here in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 6. It says, and on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. So looking back here at Ted Montgomery for the year 2022, he said that that week long feast started on April the 16th. And the way I count, it should end no earlier than about April the 22nd, a week later. But you see the Feast of First Fruits in the middle of that week. But notice back here in verse 6, it's saying that we must eat unleavened bread. We must eat unleavened bread. It's a requirement of the festival to eat unleavened bread during that week. Well, notice verse 14, where it's talking about the Feast of First Fruits. And notice that it says, and ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the self same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. So this is telling us not to eat bread. Verse 6 says that we're supposed to eat bread for the entire week. And verse 14 says that we're not supposed to eat bread after the feast of first fruits. So they are actually in conflict with one another if they land on the same day because you have the feast of unleavened bread starting on the 15th day of the month and lasting and lasting all the way to the 21st day of the month but the traditional reckoning has the day of first fruits landing on the 17th right in the middle of that week so whereas for the feast of unleavened bread you are commanded to eat bread for the entire week the Feast of First Fruit says to stop eating bread, so you can't actually do both. They're actually in conflict with one another. There's no way to do the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Unleavened Bread correctly unless they fall on different days. So this is scriptural proof that the Feast of First Fruits can't be during the Feast of Unleavened Bread else it would create a conflict and as we know the scripture has no conflicts so when does the day of first fruits actually start now we learn over in the book of jubilees that the feast of weeks and the feast of the first fruits go together they are a twofold festival so that explains why it's telling us to count weeks from the date in which we make the wave offering until we make the offering of the two loaves of bread. So they're tied together. Now, just as an aside note, what I understand, the reason why the scripture doesn't give us an exact date for the Feast of First Fruits is because there are actually two Passovers in a year. There's the first Passover or the regular Passover, but then there's actually the second Passover that happens a month later. Well, it depends on which Passover you partake in to decide when you actually start your Omar count. In other words, if you keep the second Passover in the year, that would mean that you would start your Omar count a month later. And your Feast of Weeks will also be a month later. That's why the scripture doesn't give you a definite date for the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of First Fruits. But anyway, there is scriptural proof to let us know when this festival is to start. So to understand when the Feast of First Fruits is supposed to start, we can count 50 days backwards from the Feast of Pentecost. And over in the book of Jubilees and chapter 16 is one of the places that we are told when the Feast of First Fruits is. It's in the third month, in the middle of the month. That is when Abraham kept the festival after Isaac was born. And in chapter 15, we see that he kept the Feast of First Fruits in the middle of the month as well. But if we want to know exactly when the festival of first Pentecost is supposed to land, we have to look in Jubilees chapter 44 when it's talking about Israel, 
or Jacob, and when he kept the feast of first fruits. You see here in verse 1 that on the new moon of the third month, or the beginning of the third month, he went to the well of oath. And then you see he offered a sacrifice on the seventh day of that same month. And then when we drop down to verse 3, you see that he remained there for seven days. So that's seven days after the seventh day of the month. And you see that then he celebrated the harvest festival of first fruits. So what this is telling us is that Jacob kept the feast of first fruits on the 14th day of the third month. Now, the third month is called Sivan on the sacred calendar. And we're over here at timeanddate.com, and it tells us that the 14th day of the third month is on or about the 20th. And I say it like that because, remember, you have to verify this per the sighting of the new moon. This is a calculation, and it could be off by a day or two. But it'll work for all intents and purposes because we're talking about a week difference. And when we subtract 50 days from June the 20th, 2024, we end up on May the 1st of the year 2024. But back over here at TedMontgomery.com, you see that he says that the Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks is on June the 16th almost exactly a week earlier than the 14th day of the third month and the reason why is because he's basing that date 50 days after April the 28th but we've already shown that April 28th cannot be the correct day or you would have a conflict between the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of First Fruits. and we also know that June the 16th is not the correct day because it doesn't fall in the middle of the month. The middle of the month is the 14th and the 15th day of the month. And that brings me to my last level of proof. And that's how the Feast of Pentecost has to fall on a full moon. We see that in the book of Sirach in chapter 43. How the moon is the sign of the feast days. And we see that in Psalms 81. When it's talking about the appointed times on the solemn feasts, those are talking about the three mandatory festivals that we find in the Book of the Covenant. Those are the Feast of Harvest or First Fruits or Pentecost, as we like to call it. But it also includes the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Ingathering or the Feast of Tabernacles. Those are the three mandatory festivals in the year, and they all fall on four moons. So with this information, it's clear that when it said that Abraham celebrated the Feast of Pentecost in the middle of the third month, it was talking about the full moon of the third month. So when you're looking back at the date calculator and subtracting 50 days from the correct date of Pentecost, you end up on May the 1st. And you see that that puts you completely out of the Feast of Unleavened Bread so that that day falls on his own day, the first day of the week after the Feast of Unleavened Bread had ended which is the same day that the Messiah appeared to all of his disciples after his resurrection. You remember that they saw him the day that he was resurrected, but he instructed them not to touch him at all. But it was on the eighth day after his resurrection that he not only commanded them to touch him, but he ate food and he actually communed with them for a while doing something similar to what we could consider a wave offering. So there you have it. The correct timing for the Feast of First Fruits. And in the year 2021, that would be on May the 6th.
So let's look back at Leviticus 23 and let's see how it is that we determine the correct date of the Feast of First Fruits. Now you're seeing in the sixth verse that the Feast of Unleavened Bread starts on the 15th day of the month. You see how it talks about we should eat unleavened bread for seven days. Verse 7 talks about how the first day is a holy convocation and we do no serve our work. Verse 8 says that we should have an offering made by fire for seven days and that the seventh day is also a holy convocation. Then that feast day is up. So looking at this calendar for the biblical first month, you see unleavened bread starts on the 15th. And you celebrate it for seven days with the seventh day being on the 21st day of the first month. Then it goes on to start talking about another festival, the Feast of First Fruits. Again, we still have yet to address this part where it says, When ye become into the land which I give unto you. We'll cover that in another video. But you notice in verse 10, unlike the other times that is telling us of feast days, it's not telling us the, the exact date of this festival that is calling first fruits. It's telling us to give a sheaf of the first fruits unto the priests. But in verse 11 is the first time we see when it is actually supposed to be. And it says on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So remembering back up there what we read in verse 8 how we have already completed the feast of unleavened bread this what is talking about down here in verse 11 is saying that the wave offering is to take place after the sabbath day after the feast is over so there you have the feast of unleavened bread then you have the sabbath after it is over and then you have the feast of first fruits starting the day after the sabbath on the first day of the week which would have been the eighth day after the resurrection so when you keep the feast of first fruits in the first month the feast of unleavened bread starts on the 23rd day of the first month and when you keep the feast of passover in the second month it will start on the 23rd day of the second month and you would count 50 days from that to the Feast of Pentecost. So in the year 2021, the first Feast of First Fruits will be on May the 6th. Well, when we look for the calculation for the new moon that will fall in May, we'll find that the sighting of the moon will probably be on the evening of the 12th of May, making the 13th of May the first day of the second month. So if the 13th is the first day of the second month, the 20th will be the eighth day, the 27th will be the 15th, when the Feast of Unleavened Bread will start, of course, Passover starts the day earlier. And the Sabbath day after the Feast of Unleavened Bread will be on June the 3rd. And the Feast of First Fruits will be on June the 4th. And their Pentecost will be on or about July the 24th. It would actually be the 14th day of the third month which will be somewhere around the 24th again this is all based on calculations you have to verify the moon if you want to know the exact date or at least know somebody who verifies the moon like Yahweh.com or Hermes Academy in the comment section of our new moon report videos and posts that we try to do every month all right, so we bring Stacy in. She just listened to the entire video. Stacy, so when would you say that first fruits is? Uh, first fruits would be falling on Thursday, the day after Sabbath day. It falls on the Sabbath day that falls after the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Just like today, the Feast of Unleavened Bread ends at sunset today. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow is what? Sabbath day. So tomorrow is the Sabbath day, and then the Feast of First Fruits is the day after that. Yes. That's when you do your wave offering, and then 
you, after that you will and then with that you will start the 50 day count yes so the easiest way to say it is that the feast of first fruits is the sabbath day after the end of unleavened bread yes all right so stay the when is the first fruit you want me to say it the way you want me to? No, say it the way you want to say it. The first fruits is the feast of the first feast of first fruits starts the first day of the week following the feast of unleavened bread. Absolutely. But anyway, for those of you who are watching this video late, and for those of you who don't think you got the feast of first fruits correctly in the first month. I believe you can also take advantage of the Feast of Weeks during the second month. I believe that is too why the scripture doesn't tell you exact the exact date. It kind of gives you the option of doing it in the first month or the second month. At least the way I read in Leviticus 23. But if you think I'm off base with that, let me know down in the comment section of the video. Like you always do. And we appreciate it. So, make sure you have the subscription button pushed so you can see future videos we'll put out prayerfully we'll include one on what exactly we're supposed to do on the feast of first fruits it seems to be 50 days of abstaining from all things grain but we'll be talking about that later in the meantime check out some of our other videos hit the like button and leave a comment thank you and shalom